on everybody, Aaron Smith here for Forward Gettysburg. I'm coming at you from the Trussell Farm, and if you know anything about the Trussell Farm, you will know exactly who was headquartered here during the Battle of Gettysburg. That's right, today I'm talking about the man, the myth, the legend, Major General Dan Sickles, probably the most controversial person at the Battle of Gettysburg, if not in the entire Civil War. So let's get right into it. Dan Sickles. He was born in 1819 on October 20th. However, even his date of birth is controversial because he would often tell people that he was born in 1825. And the people he would tell he was born in 1825 was often young ladies that he was trying to woo. He would make himself seem younger and more appealing to his potential suitors. What a guy. This is going to be a great episode. I'm, I am so excited to do this for you guys because Dan Sickles is probably one of my favorite people here at Gettysburg, if not in the entire Civil War. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. Born in 1819, he was born to a wealthy family. His father was George Garrett Sickles and his mother was Susan Marsh Sickles. He's going to originally learn the printer's trade with a printer press and he's going to study at what is now New York University. Um, he's from New York City, New York City boy, born and bred, and we're gonna get into that because he's gonna have a lot of important ties to New York and the city as well. Um, eventually, as he gets older, he's going to study law with Benjamin Butler. Um, he's going to be admitted to the New York bar in 1846, and he's going to use a lot of his connections, especially as a lawyer, to be elected to the New York State Assembly as well in eight, uh, a couple years later. In 1844, he is going to write a pamphlet for then um, presidential candidate James Polk, which is going to thrust him into a political career. Um, he is going to be a member of Tammany Hall, which is that great democratic political machine in New York City, which pretty much unofficially ran the city. And so through his uh, familial connections, he's going to woo a very young Teresa Bagioli. Oh baby, baby, why you acting so I'm not Italian, so I probably butchered that name, but either way, he's going to woo a young Teresa Bagioli. And she's about 15, 16 years old at the time. Um, she's a beautiful young Italian girl, daughter of a, daughter of a Sickles family friend. Her father was a, a somewhat famous composer back in the old country, um, which is also going to contribute to Sickles' love of the opera as well. She's going to be described as a beautiful, voluptuous siren without brains or shame, whom Sickles loved to madness. Um, like I said, his political career is going to launch in 1844 after writing that pamphlet supporting James Polk. He's also going to be, uh, in his lawyer career, he's going to have some questionable ethics as well. He's going to take bribes. He's going to be involved in a few minor scandals as well. Um, so you can start to see the seeds of this uh, fascinating individual starting to be planted here in New York City before the war even starts. So Dan Sickles, he is going to describe himself as a tough Democrat, a fighting one. However, George Templeton Strong, who is going to be a lifelong criti critic of Dan Sickles, <laughs> is going to say one might as well try to spoil a rotten egg as to damage Dan's character. He was the type of person who could do no wrong, it was always someone else's fault, etc, etc, etc. To kind of put it in a frame and, and pardon, the, um, pardon the comparison, but Dan Sickles was very much the Donald Trump of his time to kind of make a analogy if you will so the 1850s we're going to see Dan Sickles rise and we're going to see his fall in September 27th of 1853 him and Teresa are going to get married but also during this time Dan Sickles is involved with a New York City madam named Fanny White <laughs> And, it, and it's been rumored um, at the time that in order to progress his political career, Dan Sickles is going to get Fanny White's girls to trade um, certain acts that ladies of the night may partake in to some of his, uh, you know, the political people that he's trying to familiarize himself with and that he's trying to get them to help him move up the ranks. 
So a lot of shady stuff going on with Dan Sickles right from the beginning. Um, and all through the early 1850s and the mid 1850s, his political star is going to continue to rise. He's going to become very popular. He's actually going to become, in 1855, he's going to be appointed the legation secretary in London under James Buchanan, who was at the time ambassador to the United Kingdom. And his madam friend, Fanny White, is going to join him several times in London. Um, and it's even said that Dan Sickles introduces her to Queen Victoria. Um, he introduces her under a name um, of a New York political rival. So here's Dan Sickles. I, could, I, could, I wish I was there. Here's Dan Sickles introducing to the Queen of England at the time this New York madam, this New York, uh, you know, whore boss, if you will. <laughs> and just, I just, this guy is crazy. That's why I love Dan Sickles. Some people hate him, some people love him. I fall into the love camp. I love Dan Sickles. It's, he just, oh my gosh. He, He's a wild person and I can't help but laugh and, and, and enjoy reading about his life. He's actually going to introduce this madam to Queen Victoria um, under the name of a political rival. He's going to be elected to the U.S. House of Representatives uh, representing New York City and he's going to be in the House from 1857 to 1861. However, dun, 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 during this time, Teresa is having an affair behind Dan's back. Now, mind you, Dan was always a womanizer, so he's, not only is he having affairs with Fanny White and probably some of her girls, you know, but, but here is his own wife having affairs behind his back. So, I mean, the twisted webs we weave, guys, the twisted webs we weave. Um, so, either way, she's having an affair, not, and she's not having an affair with just anyone, she's having an affair with Philip Barton Key. Son, I believe, of Francis Scott Key, the man who wrote Star Spangled Banner. So this is just, oh my gosh, this, this, I feel like reading his life is like reading a tabloid today. It, it's so wild. So anyway, Teresa, she's having an affair with Philip Barton Key. And what they would do is Philip Barton Key was running a house, I think a block or two, um, away off of Lafayette Square and uh, Teresa would happen to work her walks around the neighborhood by this house and if it was an okay time for her to stop by for this tryst they were having um, Philip Barton Key would wave a, uh, a I believe it was a red scarf or something like that a red piece of cloth out the window to let her know like hey you know come on over see what's going on and, and and so it's just this wild wild affair that they're having anyway Dan Sickles is going to find out and he's going to confront Key and there's a famous etching of him confronting Key at Lafayette Square and he is going to shoot Philip Barton Key and he's not just going to shoot him once as as the reports that I read goes he's actually going to shoot him multiple times including several in the chest and one in the face as well and he's going to carry out He's going to carry with him several pistols as well. So this is an extremely premeditated thing. Not any type of um, self-defense or anything like that. Um, I want to say that Philip Barton Key has a lantern at the time. So anyway, this is going to go on and there's going to be a huge court case. And this is like the OJ trial of the time. And, and... It's an incredibly, incredibly salacious court case happening. Everyone is glued to the newspapers looking for any update on, on the Key and Sickles murder um, story. And what's going to happen is that Sickles is going to get an all-star defense team, including Edwin Stanton, who will later go on to be Secretary of War under Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War. <laughs> So he has an all-star defense team, very much like O.J. might have, and Francis Scott Key is going to get off of the murder charge. He's going to be found not guilty by way of temporary insanity. The very first time that that uh, defense was successful ever in the United States. So he's going to get off 
of his murder charge by way of temporary insanity. And and I mean I mean this is all over the newspapers. This is huge news for the day. Months afterwards, um, Dan Sickles is is one of the most famous people in the world, and his star is still rising. He's incredibly popular worldwide, um, e even despite the fact that he murdered someone essentially in cold blood over this affair. Even though he also was having several affairs himself. Either way, Dan Sickles is going to come out publicly and apologize. And, and forgive Teresa for the affair. And so now what's gonna happen is Dan Sickles' rising star is now going to fall. He is going, um, the fallout and the scandal from him forgiving his adulterous wife, despite his own adulterous activity himself, the fallout from him forgiving his wife publicly, I believe it was some kind of published paper or something like that that he put in, in several of the, of the newspapers, um, the fallout and the scandal from him forgiving his wife is going to essentially ruin his political career. It's going to be much worse, and, and, and the, and the pushback is going to be much worse than the murder itself. Um, and his public forgiveness, like I said, is essentially going to ruin his political career. Now, Dan Sickles, beginning of the Civil War, is not a very popular person in America anymore. Um, like I said, he has forgiven his wife, which has led to a lot of pushback, and he decides to kind of retreat from the public eye in 1861. However, also in 1861, we know that the Civil War is now um, ramping up, and so Dan Sickles sees this as an opportunity to improve his public image. So what he's going to do is he's going to um, repair his public image by helping to raise and muster troops in his hometown of New York City. And he's actually going to raise an entire brigade known as the Excelsior Brigade. Behind the camera up that direction, uh, to the west of course is Excelsior Field there. And we have the Excelsior Monument as well. So he's going to raise a brigade, um, he's going to become a brigadier general, and he's going to get in really, really tight with the likes of Joseph Hooker and Dan Butterfield. And Abraham Lincoln, who you know is a, is a politician as well, just like Dan Sickles, he sees Sickles' rising star and what Sickles is doing for um, the Union cause. He sees that as an opportunity to help garner some of the support of the Democrats because Dan Sickles was a Tammany Hall Democrat. So Abraham Lincoln is going to develop this relationship with Dan Sickles as well in order to garner support. So Dan Sickles is an incredibly opportunistic individual He's in tight with the likes of Joseph Hooker, uh, Dan Butterfield, Abraham Lincoln, the President of the United States himself. So he's slowly going to start to rise up the ranks. And he's going to become a Brigadier General. And then he's going to be in charge of a division. And then um, right on uh, the cusp of Chancellorsville, um, actually, uh, sorry, a little bit before Chancellorsville, on January 16th, Abraham Lincoln is going to nominate Dan Sickles for promotion to Major General. Now mind you, Dan Sickles has no prior military experience. In 1853, he was a major in a militia, but outside of that, Dan Sickles has no major military experience. He never went to West Point or even, you know, one, one of the other academies like VMI or something like that. He has nothing. So other than, you know, being in a militia, and at the time, militias were more like, um, more like social clubs where they would march around and maybe do some target practice and stuff and, and and make sure their uniforms looked good they you know he didn't really have a whole lot of military experience so he is going to be confirmed on March 11th 1863 as um, a major general and his boy hooker is going to give him command of the third corps so here we are very little military experience, given command of an entire corps of the Army of the Potomac. And of course we know March, about two months later, we're going to have the Battle of Chancellorsville that's going to happen um, there on May 1st to like the 6th or 7th of 1863. And Dan Sickles is going to be in charge of the 3rd Corps. And he's going to make some questionable decisions. Um, but he's also going to make some good decisions as well. He's going to um, he's going to see actually kind of like the tail end of Jackson's flank attack marching down 
um, the road there and he's going to report to, you know, his higher ups and they're just going to kind of blow him off. But he wants to get at these guys. That night he's going to order uh, a night attack into the wilderness against what he thought were some confederate pickets. Um, which ordering a night attack in the first place in the Civil War is, is crazy. It's incredibly risky. Not to mention ordering a night attack into the wilderness, this really thick second growth forest there um, that surrounds Chancellorsville and of course Spotsylvania and, and all those kind of areas. You know, it, it's just pure madness, a, a huge military blunder. Um, so then he's going to find himself in a position at Hazel, Hazel Grove, which is kind of a an elevated, you know, kind of like a plateau almost, great artillery position. Um, and he's going to be ordered to fall back from that position by Joseph Hooker. And he doesn't want to. He's going to be very reluctant because he, he really likes the position. It's a great artillery position. Um, he feels that it's strong. He feels that it's a reinforced position. But nonetheless, he's going to be ordered by Joseph Hooker, who at that time was more than likely um, suffering from a concussion due to the cannonball, due to a cannonball hitting the uh, pillar of the Chancellor House there. Um, but nonetheless, he's going to order Dan Sickles to pull back. And as Dan Sickle pulls back, E.P. Alexander is going to see Hazel Grove, which is, again, this awesome artillery position, is totally unattended. And he sees the Union Army um, moving backward, falling back off that position. He's going to order his cannon um, onto that position, and he's going to just unleash a hell hellacious fire onto the Third Corps. And they're going to take a lot of heavy casualties from that cannon fire. Um, so that being said, that uh, the Battle of Chancellorsville is going to bring us to the Battle of Gettysburg, where Dan Sickles makes probably one of the most controversial choices of the entire Civil War. So on July 1st, the fighting at Gettysburg is going to be between the 1st Corps and the 11th Corps. Now, the 3rd Corps, which of course is under Dan Sickles' command, um, is part of what they would call the left wing of the army who's going to be commanded by John Reynolds. Um, John Reynolds is going to send a messenger to Dan Sickles to send his corps up and send him up in a hurry. They're currently around the Emmitsburg area. They're going to come up the Emmitsburg road and Dan Sickles is going to get orders to take the position where Geary's uh, division was. Geary's division, his left, was resting just on Little Round Top. So Dan Sickles, he's going to take the line from about the uh, end of the Second Corps there, um, where the Pennsylvania Monument is, and he's going to extend the line, and his left end is going to end somewhere at the base of Little Round Top. Now, Dan Sickles doesn't like that position. Uh, that position isn't really elevated. You're, what you see in front of you is going to be a lot of trees, hills, stuff like that, farms. So he's not going to be able to, to really see a whole lot. And more importantly, he's not going to think it's a good position for his artillery. So, on the way up the Emmitsburg Road earlier, Dan Sickles spied out what we're going to call the Emmitsburg Ridge, which of course is the area of the Peach Orchard right behind me. Beautiful spot on the battlefield actually really hopping. I had to try to do some camera magic to, to keep all the cars and buses out of the way. Uh, there's a tour group going off to the side of me here, so I want to try to be respectful of those uh, people as well. Um, either way, he's going to notice what we call the Emmitsburg Ridge, which is going to be this peach orchard area. It's going to go across the wheat field road there um, where the Jay Wentz house would have been, and of course the Sherfy farm, which is just through the peach orchard up this little hill as well. Dan Sickles really, really likes this spot. It reminds him a lot of Hazel Grove. Um, so he is going to seek permission to move his core forward out of that little swell there at the end of Cemetery Ridge where it kind of dips down before Little Round Top starts. He doesn't like it. He kind of feels like he's in this like marshy swamp. He doesn't like it a whole lot, but he loves the Peach Orchard position. He really, really likes this position. So. Dan Sickles is going to seek permission first from George Gordon Meade, the commander of the Army of the Potomac at Gettysburg. So he's going to send off for Meade. Meade's going to be really, really busy. He's not going to be able to talk to him. He just kind of brushes him off. Um, doesn't even give him the light of day. He's busy. 
So Sickles is going to wait for a little bit. And he's still really, really convinced that he's in a terrible spot on the line, that he wants to move forward here to what he thinks is a, a much better position for his artillery. So he's going to then seek out Governor K. Warren from the, Ar from the um, Army Corps of Engineers, the chief engineer at the Battle of Gettysburg. Governor K. Warren, he's busy. He doesn't give Dan Sickles the light of day. Eventually he's going to keep sending couriers, couriers, and George Meade is going to tell Henry Hunt, the chief of artillery, go out and see what Dan Sickles wants. So, Hunt is going to ride out, convene with Dan Sickles. Dan Sickles is going to show him the position. Hunt is going to agree with Dan Sickles and say this is a good spot for artillery. Dan Sickles says, well then, can you act on behalf of um, the, uh, the uh, general commanding and give me permission to move my troops forward? Hunt says, no, 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 I can't do that, but I will agree with you. It's a good art artillery position. Um, I'll say something to Meade. So around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, July 2nd, 1863, Dan Sickles is going to twist and warp in his mind what Hunt says as being an actual permission on behalf of George Gordon Meade to move his entire corps forward. So Dan Sickles is going to move his divisions forward to the Peach Orchard, and he's going to create a salient. The salient is going, the point of the salient is going to be somewhere over in this direction, and it's an incredibly thin line. Part of the reason Dan Sickles didn't like his original position is because he felt that his line was too thin. Well now he has moved his entire corps forward without the permission of the General of the Army of the Potomac and instead of the original position he has extended his troops into a position nearly twice as long. <laughs> He's going to extend his troops up the Emmitsburg Road there along the road move some troops forward to the Sherfee farm there um, that is going to be, it's going to order A.A. Humphreys Division. They're going to take the, the position along the Emmitsburg Road stretching here to kind of the Peach Orchard over here. And then Bernie's Division is going to extend the line from the Peach Orchard down to the Stony Hill. And there's going to be a 500 yard gap between the Peach Orchard and the Stony Hill. And Stickle's plan is to fill that gap with a thin line of skirmishers and also some cannons. <laughs> I just, like I said earlier, Dan Sickles has very, very limited military experience. This is the, the classic case of someone who is in way, way over their head, and now they're in a position and it's, oh crap, like, what do I do? I think we've all been in that position uh, where we've gotten in over our head and you know, uh, what do I do? <laughs> so his plan is to fill this 500 yard gap with a thin line of skirmishers backed up by artillery on the Wheatfield Road. Then he's going to have a brigade um, over by the Wheatfield itself and then he's going to end, um, he's going to have Trobriand's brigade in the Wheatfield and then the end of his position is going to be Ward's brigade at Devil's Den uh, anchored by Smith's 4th New York Artillery. Uh, six. Um, he's going to have six 10-pounder ordnance guns there, I believe. I'd have to double check. I'll let you know. Either way, an extremely thin line. Dan Sickles is very pleased with the line. Now, at the time, George Meade is actually having a, a, a meeting with a lot of the Corps commanders and higher-ups, and he's wondering where Sickles is. So he's going to ride off and find that Sickles has moved his entire corps forward. Not only that, but by the time that they all get in position, we have artillery firing from Seminary Ridge off in that direction. That's not the Union artillery firing, that is Confederate artillery firing on this position. Meade realizes, well, it's too late now, we better try to reinforce it. So essentially what Dan Sickles, the situation on July 2nd in the afternoon, is Dan Sickles has brought his, the entire 3rd Corps forward about three quarters of a mile away from any type of support or reinforcement. <laughs> the nearest Corps being the 2nd Corps, whose left flank ended there about the uh, Pennsylvania Monument. And now we have an imminent attack from the Confederates. 
of course, that is going to be Longstreet's assault on July 2nd. And he, Longstreet is going to assault in echelon. So we're going to have um, McClaw's division attacking and Hood's division attacking. And we're going to have uh, elements of Anderson's division attacking um, from the 3rd Corps. And this is not good. This is not good. To fight off an entire division down there um, at the Wheat Field and at Devil's Den, there are two, reg er, two brigades. So they're going to bring forward a bunch of reinforcements from the 2nd Corps. Um, and the 2nd Corps, their lines are going to be thinned and eventually the echelon attack is going to work. The entire idea behind an echelon attack is that you start attacking one part of the line, the enemy then reinforces from other parts of the line, and you continue an attack like a domino effect down the line until you find the weak point and break through and, the, and, and route the enemy. So what's going to happen is that it's going to be incredibly fierce fighting on Little Round Top. There's going to be incredibly fierce fighting at Devil's Den. I mean, just incredibly confusing, just melee in the wheat field back and forth so many times. And then it's going to eventually reach up here. We're going to have Barksdale's Mississippians, Barksdale's Brigade of Mississippians. They're going to attack and they're going to break the Union line here at the wheat field. And Barksdale Mississippians, they're actually going to drive the Union all the way back to the Trostle Farm. Which is where our video started at. And this is not a good day for the Union. Um, however, the 5th Corps is eventually going to come up and help stabilize that line. And by the time the fighting has ended, the Union has been pushed back from the Peach Orchard. But um, they were able to stabilize their line there along Cemetery Ridge. So essentially, I would call the second day a draw. Um, the Confederates were able to hold uh, the Peach Orchard and some other positions. Um, they were able to roll some of their cannons here. However, I'm not here in this video to get into a breakdown of the second day's action here on the left flank of the Union line. I'm here to talk about Dan Sickles. Dan Sickles, after the Battle of Gettysburg, he is going to claim um, that he was the savior of the battle. Dan Sickles is going to be wounded by a cannonball in his leg, his right leg. His right leg is going to be amputated a few days later. Um, and he's actually going to keep his leg in a museum in Philadelphia and visit it quite often. <laughs> uh, I, I love Dan Sickles. He's such, a, such an incredible, incredible person for a lot of different reasons. So he's going to visit his leg at the museum in Philadelphia. But the thing is, because he is now wounded, he is going to get back to Washington, D.C. before the official reports of the Battle of Gettysburg are compiled and, and presented to, um, to the government. So Dan Sickles is going to paint himself as the hero of Gettysburg, the man who saved the day, the man who uh, bravely brought his, his entire Third Corps forward and thwarted the Confederate attack. However, he had no idea the Confederate attack was going to happen. Um, he had sent uh, two, two of the regiments of Verdant's sharpshooters, the second and first U.S. sharpshooters, up into the woods over there on a seminary ridge with a few companies of the third main as well they caught what they think um was uh the right flank of wilcox's brigade up there um, and there was some light skirmishing as well um, so they knew there was some type of force here but they didn't realize that it was an entire you know almost an entire confederate corps uh, plus portions of another corps as well moving into position for this great attack that's going to happen here on july 2nd Dan Sickles, when he's wounded, he is going, uh, the story goes that he is going to be very cool under pressure, under this uh, incredible wounding that happens. And when he's carted off the field in an ambulance, they said that he is going to be coolly puffing on a cigar. Um, just, <laughs> just another great Dan Sickles story, man. Like, there's so many of them. Uh, this is going to be such a long video, and I hope you're enjoying it as I'm talking about Dan Sickles. But I said he's going to be carted off the field, puffing a cigar, uh, just this very, very uh, bravado figure that's going on. Um, so after the battle, he's going to paint himself as the hero of Gettysburg. And he's also going to, um, after the war ends in the post-war years, he's going to lead several vicious attacks against General Meade. 
um, against General Meade's character. He's going to use the Pipe Creek line plan, um, the Pipe Creek circular that we discussed in a previous video. He's going to use that against Meade and say that Meade's intentions the entire time were to retreat, um, which they weren't. The Pipe Creek was just like a, a backup plan, like a plan B in case stuff went south here. Um, either way, he's going to use the Pipe Creek circular against Meade. He's going to claim that he wanted to retreat and that Dan Sickles made the stand and, and practically single-handedly forced me to fight the enemy at Gettysburg. So that's the so the debate that happens um, talking about Dan Sickles at Gettysburg comes down to this: was it a genius move or was it just such a stupid blunder? Like how could anybody ever do that? Um, <sighs> Personally, as, as base and awesome as I think Dan Sickles is for his personal life, I think Gettysburg was a huge blunder. Um, not only did he directly go against orders to maintain his position, but him doing so cost thousands and thousands of lives on July 2nd, um, nearly cost the Union their position on Cemetery Ridge, an incredibly important position. Um, so I, I don't think Dan Sickles was this brilliant military genius. I think he was more of a a madman and egotistical narcissistic person that you know he's going to have it his way um, I think he also was probably getting some flashbacks of Hazel Grove at Chancellorsville and, and the great defeat and, and how much they suffered there and he saw another great artillery position and didn't want to give up that artillery position to the enemy George Meade is later gonna say that the peach orchard itself was no man's land no person no no units from any army could hold this ground without putting themselves in a position to be attacked or shelled from the other um, opposing side. So George Meade, I think, is probably correct, more correct than anyone here, that this is not a strategically important position whatsoever. Because even though the Confederates are going to hold it, and on July 3rd they're going to post some cannon here that are going to partake in that great barrage, which we also talked about in a previous video, they're still going to be facing firing... Um, you know from Little Round Top and, and some of those other areas as well so this isn't a great position for either side however in typical Dan Sickles fashion 34 years later after the Battle of Gettysburg Dan Sickles is going to be awarded the Medal of Honor <laughs> I can't I can't say this stuff without laughing because it just cracks me up man he's just so gung-ho about this I, I i love dan sickles i'll give it to him dan sickles is going to get the medal of honor and on the uh on the medal of honor at the ceremony um they're going to say that he displayed most conspicuous gallantry on the field vigorously contesting the advance of the enemy and continuing to encourage his troops after being himself severely wounded so dan sickles is going to move the core, the third core up here, get the entire core destroyed, create a salient in the Union line, forward three quarters of a mile from his nearest support, um, cost the lives of countless men, north and south, um, disobeys orders, but because he smoked a cigar on his way out of the battlefield, on the way to the hospital, he is going to get the Medal of Honor. That is, that is trademark Dan Sickles, guys. So after the Civil War, Dan Sickles' life is still going to be very colorful. Uh, he's going to be the ambassador to Spain from 1869 to 1874. And one-legged Dan Sickles is still as ever the ladies' man. He is going to woo and have an affair with the deposed Queen Isabella II of Spain. <laughs> God, what a man, what a man. Um, sadly, Teresa is going to die in 1867. Uh, Dan Sickles is going to remarry a woman named uh, Carmina Crail, who is a French woman. Uh, he's going to have two children with her. Later on in the post-battle years, post after Gettysburg, Dan Sickles is actually going to strike up a friendship with James Longstreet, of all people, his opponent here on the second day. Um, 
James Longstreet at the time was also facing a lot of criticism for his actions during the war. Uh, he had joined the Republican Party. He had helped with Reconstruction. A lot of people in the South, especially um, other generals, uh, Jubal Early sticks out as one that absolutely hated, hated Longstreet in the post-war years. Um, they are going to label him all kinds of terrible things like traitor and, and carpetbagger and all this kind of stuff. But nonetheless, him and Dan Sickles are going to strike up a friendship, probably because they were both experiencing um, similar criticisms as well. Um, Dan Sickles, he is going to be appointed the honorary chairman of the New York Monument Association. And he's actually going to, um, at first in that society, do a lot of really, really great work. Um, for the veterans of uh, the Civil War, especially the veterans here at Gettysburg. He's going to put up a lot of monuments. A lot of the monuments in this area and the battlefield itself come directly from um, Dan Sickles' efforts. And I can tell you from having been on this battlefield countless times that the New York monuments are always the bougiest monuments out there. And I think that is a testament to Dan Sickles himself. <laughs> New York has probably one of the tallest monuments there in the National Cemetery. New York always has very ornate monuments. If you go check out the Excelsior Monument to the Excelsior Brigade, I mean, it's, it's this very bougie Roman arch um, design going on. So, and that's even for not just the Gettysburg Battlefield, but like if you go to any battlefield and you pick the most ornate the, the prettiest, uh, you know, the, the best bronze reliefs, you can probably guarantee that that's a New York monument. Um, for example, Antietam sticks out, the New York monument there. It's just this huge, you know, bougie thing with these Roman, great Roman columns and stuff. And, you know, I have to imagine that is probably part of Dan Sickles' handiwork with the New York Monument Association. However, Dan Sickles' life, as always, is never without controversy. Dan Sickles is going to be forced out of the New York Monument Association in 1912 when it was discovered that he had been embezzling money to the tune of $27,000, which back in 1912 was not a small sum whatsoever. Um, in 1892, uh, Dan Sickles again is going to be elected as the Democratic representative for New York City um, to the U.S. Congress, and he's going to serve from 1893 to 1895. And during that time there, he's going to sponsor legislation to form the, the Gettysburg National Military Park. And it's going to help to buy up private land and again, erect some of the monuments that you see here when you visit the park. Interesting thing to those who visit Gettysburg is you notice that most of the Union generals, um, Corps commanders, have their own monument. We all know about the Hancock Monument, the Slocum Monument, um, the, the, the Meade Monument. But Dan Sickles doesn't have his own monument. Dan Sickles doesn't have his own memorial here on the Gettysburg Battlefield. And one person actually asked Dan Sickles about that while he was alive. And Dan Sickles is reported to have said this to this person that the entire battlefield is a memorial to me. This is where Dan Sickles, where his mind is, uh, incredibly narcissistic person, but I, I think he's awesome nonetheless. Dan Sickles is going to live the remainder of his life in New York City, um, and he will sadly die of a cerebral hemorrhage on May 3rd, 1914. He's going to die at the ripe old age of 94 years old with his leg it's gonna be damp. <laughs> but sadly he is going to pass away at 94 years old and Dan Sickles is going to be buried in Arlington National Cemetery well guys that's what I have for you today this is gonna to be a long one um, but nonetheless I think he Dan Sickles is probably one of the if not the most colorful character at the Battle of Gettysburg during the Civil War his life is just like a soap opera. It's a page turner. Um, there's a lot of great books out there about him. Um, one is called Dan Sickles, The Life, which is, which is a biography about his entire life, which is a great read. Um, another good book that I recently just finished 
um, was written actually by a licensed battlefield guy, James Hessler, Jim Hessler, um, and it's about Dan Sickles, and I forget the long title, it's Dan Sickles at Gettysburg, How One Man Lost Little Round Top, uh, did something else, but was still called the Hero of Gettysburg. Either way, um, that's, I know that for sure that's available at the um, Gettysburg National Military Park Visitor Center and Cyclorama um, there on the Baltimore Pike. Uh, when I was there, I bought a copy and turned out to be a signed copy, so hey, that's pretty cool. Um, Jim, if you're listening, thank you, appreciate it. Um, but either way, that's a great book that uh, discusses a lot of what we talked about today, especially the actions. Um, you know, break it down by regiment and brigade and the different positions and stuff. I want to save all that stuff for future videos, but I wanted to talk about the man, the myth, the legend himself, Dan Sickles. Incredibly cool guy. As always, my name is Aaron Smith. This is Forward Gettysburg. Thank you guys so much for joining me today as we talk about one of my favorite topics, if you can't tell by my excitement through the whole video. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate all of the support on the channel. We are we are growing, growing slowly, but growing nonetheless. Please remember to like, subscribe, tell all your friends about us. Um, I actually had these cool little business cards printed up because oftentimes I'll be out here on the battlefield and there will be a lot of people wondering what the heck is that guy doing talking to a camera all by himself. So I can hand him these while we're Gettysburg, watch us on YouTube. Um, and, you know, get the word out there about some of the awesome stuff that's going on at the channel. As always, Aaron Smith, we're Forward Gettysburg, and I will catch you on the next one. <laughs>